honored, Ben, to be, be part of this uh, because I know that uh, you are doing a really good job uh, at the Center for Risk and Crisis Communication. And I've been following uh, several of your previous coffee and uh, crisis talks. And I was also part of that two-day seminar or webinar you mentioned that was really, uh, really good. So I have really good uh, respect for you and it's great uh, to be a guest here. Uh, I will be happy to, as we have discussed, to talk a little bit about uh, the research I've done uh, regarding the two books that I've written. Uh, so I'll give a short presentation first, and then, as you mentioned, we can have an open discussion about uh, anything. And this is really, really timely for me, because you mentioned my first book, which came out in 2018, uh, but my new book, which is uh, focusing on uh, the human side of disasters, uh, came out yesterday. So I haven't seen it in print yet, but uh, yesterday was the day of the launch. So that's a, a perfect timing for, for talking about it. So let's see if I can uh, share my screen. Let's see. Do you see something now? Not yet. Now, let's see. There. See, this is why Kaijal asked for a technical review first, and I said, no problem. <laughs> there you go, now you're on. Okay, great. Um, let's see. That's one second here. Yeah, you see the, the picture now? Yeah, it looks great. Good, good. So this uh, is, uh, let's see. Just a, a short uh, introduction first about uh, who I am and why I came into this. And uh, just very shortly about uh, myself, I live in Norway, as you all uh, realize. And uh, I have a wife who is actually from Canada, from uh, Yellowknife. And we have three grown up kids. Uh, two of them are with us now. Uh, I'm actually calling you from our cabin in, in the mountains. So that's very, very nice. And I have a day job, which is in the Ministry of Transport in uh, Norway. But I'm not talking to you, of course, now as a representative of, of the ministry. I'm talking as a private uh, person. And I think like many of you guys probably, and lots of people in this field, I came into crisis communication and crisis management really by, by accident and by chance. And it uh, started way back in 2004 uh, when the tsunami hit Asia. And I'm sure you all remember that. And of course that was far away from Norway, but uh, there were at that time more than 5,000 uh, Norwegians uh, on vacation in Thailand. And so there was a lot of work to be done regarding crisis communication and victim support at that time. Also because uh, 84 of the Norwegians who were there died. So it was a real tragedy for uh, Norway. And I started working then more and more on crisis communication for the government, uh, which came in very handy in 2011, when, as I'm sure you also remember, Norway had a very bad terrorist attack, uh, first in Oslo, where eight people were killed. And then the same guy, perpetrator, uh, traveled to the small island of Utøya, where there was a youth camp, and he killed uh, 69 of them uh, there. And uh, I was then called in to help uh, the government with the crisis communication and also after a few days uh, taking uh, care of, of the victims and uh, more uh, victim support. So after that, in 2011, I started doing some, uh, some traveling and talking about uh, these uh, experiences and some lessons learned. I traveled three times to Toronto to be part in the World Conference on Disaster Management. Uh, which was a really great uh, conference, and I presented there in 2014, 2015, and 2016. And I also learned a lot there, and of course met 
lots of very knowledgeable people who I still am in contact with. So that was uh, really great. And then lately, uh, for the last year or so, I've been, uh, of course, like many of you, very involved in handling the COVID-19 uh, crisis, which is still a big crisis in Norway. We are still in almost lockdown and all stores are closed, all restaurants are still closed here. So we are still working on, uh, on handling that. And I'm not going to talk too much about that, but we have had many challenges regarding crisis communication. Uh, and I was for a while uh, leading a group of 10 communications advisors from various ministries and the office of the prime minister uh, working on social media to try to handle the, the, the COVID-19 um, problems we had or, and still have in Norway. And then, uh, like you mentioned, Ben, uh, maybe five years ago, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine about my experience and uh, my interest in, in crisis communication. And he said to me, why don't you write a book? And I thought, yeah, well, that could be fun and interesting. And I didn't think more about it. But then I started having the thoughts more and more in, in the back of my head. And I decided that, yes, maybe I should write uh, a book about uh, crisis communication and my personal experience in, in that. And that uh, was uh, the start of uh, this book uh, that you mentioned, Ben, uh, which was published by Routledge in 2018. Um, and I wanted to write a, a, a little bit of a different kind of a, a book on crisis communication. Uh, so the first half of the book focuses on uh, 11 different, uh, what I call case studies, where I looked at uh, uh, 11 different uh, disasters that had happened around the world and focused really on how crisis communication was handled. Sometimes it was handled really well and then I described uh, what we could learn from that. And there were also of course a few examples of uh, less, uh, less good crisis communication if you if you uh, could say that. And it, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, Dr. Covello and his talks. And uh, I remember one talk he was uh, challenged to, to talk about uh, or to mention three uh, times when there had been really, really bad crisis communication. And one of them uh, he mentioned then was the train disaster in, uh, I'm not sure how you say it, Lac Megantic in Canada. Uh, yeah, that's and, right. Lac Megantic. Uh, yes. Uh, and so that's one of the chapters in this book, uh, how really, really bad. Uh, the train management handled uh, that uh, situation. But they also talked about uh, the flood in Queensland and the Tasmania bushfire. And that was actually based on someone I met at, uh, in Toronto on one of those World Conference on Disaster Management uh, seminars. And so I divided these case studies into these three groups that you see here, the transportation sector, which of course has a lot of, uh, of challenges and they are in a special situation, I think, uh, especially the airlines, because they know that sometimes something can happen. And luckily for us uh, who like traveling, there are less and less uh, transportation accidents uh, with major airlines. But when they happen, they are really, really uh, bad. And uh, there's still lots of lessons learned. And I know that Jennifer, who is one of the people uh, attending here, could talk about that for many hours because uh, I've learned a lot uh, from her. And then um, this book also has the second part is more regular chapters on, on media handling, social media. I chose to have a dedicated chapter on the aviation industry, just because as I mentioned, there is so much to learn from, from the various uh, airline accidents that have uh, happened. And I wrote about uh, family support, and I had a, a short, shorter chapter about how to prepare and how to organize exercises, uh, for example. I could talk a lot about this book, but I don't have time to, to talk too much. But I wanted to just mention um, two, uh, two um, illustrations that I think are, are quite helpful. And I made this for the book, and it's supposed to, to try to convey uh, the importance of uh, internal communication. Uh, when you're working on a crisis. And I have seen, at least from my experience working in Norway, that it's very important that you have prepared in advance 
how you want together want to work together with the CEO and the top management, with the communications team and with the HR people. And uh, a lot can be done in advance, uh, I think. Uh, at least that's my experience, that you, you talk before something happens about how you will work together. And for example, the CEO and the HR depart department need to do a lot of talking uh, about how to handle uh, deaths among uh, employees, for example. And also how you want to handle when you're visiting a, a family assistance center where there might be many, many people who, who need to talk to you. I also think this is a very good illustration and I can talk very nicely about this because I haven't made it myself, but I found it uh, from, or I gotten it from two friends of mine in the Netherlands. And that's a very simple uh, uh, illustration that I think conveys a lot. And it has to do with the perception of a crisis. And it describes how sometimes uh, the perception can be very, very different within an organi organization and outside of an organization. And sometimes, for example, uh, the management team might say that, no, 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 this is not a big crisis. But the people who have been affected are saying that it's a very big crisis and it could be a big crisis and a big challenge for them. And I, of course, as this uh, illustration says, it's the people outside who define what the crisis is. It doesn't matter if the management says that it's not a crisis, if uh, your publics say something very, very different. So I think this is a very good and very simple explanation of some of the challenges we face uh, when talking about crisis uh, communication. But I wanted to talk mostly about this book because this book is uh, what many of you who are participating here have been in touch with me uh, in regards to. And uh, I mentioned that uh, there was one uh, chapter in my first book that had to do with victim support. And that was also the largest chapter. And uh, in the... Um, in the introduction to that chapter, I wrote that this could really have been its own book because the more research I did, the more I found out that there was lots of interesting topics to discuss. But I didn't have much time and much uh, many pages to do that on, in, in the first book. But then I suggested to Routledge, uh, my publisher, that uh, I could write a book only about uh, managing the human dimension of disasters. And uh, they agreed with me. And this is a book that I have uh, really high hopes for because I think it's uh, very up to date and uh, it, ca it has its own chapter on COVID-19, uh, for example. And it also has a lot of personal interviews and personal stories from people I have been meeting when I have been researching uh, this book. It's also about 400 pages and has uh, about 50 illustrations. So it was a, a, a lot of work to, to get it done. And uh, of course I have my day job, I have a, a family. So uh, I have to do this writing on uh, weekends and on uh, evenings. And uh, a few times actually I've taken a week or two off and spent it here at uh, the cabin, just by myself having it as kind of a Writers, writers retreat, which has worked really, really nice when you're all alone and you can focus on, on the writing part. And uh, this book covers then many types of, uh, of people who are affected by a crisis. And in the, in the, on the front page, it says the bereaved survivors and first responders. And I wanted to make the definition of first responders as wide as possible. And usually we talk about first responders only as, you know, the police and uh, the people from the fire brigade and the ambulance service, all the blue lights uh, coming to a disaster area. But I wanted to, to make it a, a wider definition, as I mentioned. So I've also been writing about uh, journalists who cover uh, disasters. I've talked to ministers who are helping people uh, afterwards. I've talked to communications people, uh, for example, in, in the UK who have had uh, challenges. And I've talked to DVI experts, you know, the people who are dealing with uh, identification of the dead 
who also are, in, in my opinion, uh, one kind of uh, first responders. And this book has a, a different uh, um, participation and a different uh, set of, of, uh, of the way it's structured. Uh, the first part uh, talks about the timeline uh, of a disaster, uh, where I write a lot about the immediate part, which is the first uh, hours and the first days. Uh, then I talk about the short-term challenges and the long-term uh, challenges. And in my opinion, the long-term challenges last really forever. Because you can't say anymore that, uh, you know, some people have been telling me that after one year or two years, uh, their neighbors and their friends uh, say that uh, now you should have gotten over this. Uh, now you can start uh, moving on with your life. But my experience from talking to so many bereaved and so many survivors is that uh, that's not going to happen. And we can't expect it to happen. And we shouldn't. Because uh, when someone has survived or been affected by a large disaster, uh, it will affect them for the rest of their lives. So that's a big point in, in this book, I think. The second part talk, talks about people. And I've tried to divide them into two groups, but they are uh, kind of very shady, very gray areas. But I talk about the directly affected, which are uh, you know the survivors, the family members of people who die, the friends of those who die. And I also talk about the family members of the killer who is also affected. Uh, for example, after a mass shooting, the person who did the shooting, he has a family too. And that's a, a group of people that we very seldom hear anything about. And then the last part uh, talks about uh, coping and uh, recovery. Uh, I've talked to uh, experts who are dealing with uh, psychotherapy. And I've talked to a, a doctor who is an expert in what's called EMDR, eye movement uh, desensitization uh, therapy. Very, very interesting when it just has to do with moving your eyes uh, in a way to, to try to uh, get over something that has happened uh, that's been really bad to you. And so in the book, I have presented this uh, picture on the on, uh, which you see on the right which is what I call the building blocks of uh, victim support. And all of these uh, building blocks are uh, chapters uh, in my book. And I think it's interesting to see that some parts of, of uh, these building blocks are, might be topics that uh, you wouldn't really think uh, are important, but uh, that uh, prove to be very important uh, for the people who have been directly or indirectly affected by a crisis. Uh, for example, uh, I have written quite a bit about ceremonies and monuments. I could talk a little bit about that uh, afterwards too, uh, because we see that uh, building a monument uh, can be a very, very large uh, challenge, but also very important uh, for the people who have been affected uh, by a crisis. I've described many types of support groups, and uh, in Norway, and I know in Manchester, Anne, that uh, there have been uh, some very good uh, feedback from organizing support groups for those who have been affected by a disaster. And then uh, again, we see that uh, this is something that takes a long time uh, to heal and that we really have to have a, a long time uh, perspective uh, when you're thinking, when you're dealing with the people who have been either surviving a crisis or uh, been affected by it uh, otherwise. And since uh, the title of the book uh, talks about the human dimension uh, of this disaster, uh, I think it is, uh, or it, for me, it was very important to meet people uh, face to face when researching this book. So you see here a list of some of the cities that I traveled to, uh, to talk to people uh, directly uh, and interview them for, for the book. And of course, it's not possible right now because of COVID-19. Uh, so I was very lucky to do most of the research uh, before uh, 2020. And I was able to, to travel to all these places to meet with some excellent people who were willing to share their stories uh, with me. And I was also lucky because I got a grant from a Norwegian Authors Association. 
and uh, I spent all that money on these uh, travels because to me it's so important as much as possible to be sitting in the same room with the person you're talking to especially when it comes to topics that uh, are quite hard to to discuss and are very emotional and on several occasions uh, the person I talked to uh, started crying or started having uh, tears in their eyes because it was hard for them to to go back and talk about their uh, memories but uh, at the same time it was I think almost overwhelming that so many people were willing to talk and willing to share their stories and they said that it was very important for them uh, to get the their stories into my book so that maybe other people could learn from uh, their experiences learn from their mistakes and uh, and hopefully uh, be in a better position when the next crisis happens and I can't, of course, mention all of these uh, people I, I met, but uh, people were really willing to, to do a lot to, to see me. And one, one guy, Steve Campbell, he lives in Seattle, but he was willing to travel to Los Angeles when I was there just to meet me. And uh, that was the same over and over again, that people really were willing to talk. And uh, that was, of course, a, a great experience for me and a, a lot of learning experience for me as well. To talk to all these uh, people. So this uh, book also has a few case studies but not in the same detail as uh, the first book. Uh, I mentioned COVID-19 which is uh, its own chapter here but I also talk of course about uh, the Parkland shooting, uh, the shooting in Las Vegas uh, and also some uh, disasters that at least in Norway we didn't hear about very much. I have written down here the Sevol disaster I'm not sure if you all of you know about that, but that was a, a really big tragedy in South Korea uh, in I think 2013 or 2014, when a ferry with 450 people or so capsized and more than 400 people and many of them students died uh, in that uh, disaster. And so I've written about uh, that as well and there were many, many learning points. And one was the way media was covering that uh, tragedy. And uh, it was actually uh, sent uh, broadcast live while it was capsizing on national TV, which of course was an extra burden on, uh, on the parents uh, of the students who were on board and who they then realized would be dying when the ship uh, capsized. I've also written a bit about uh, disasters that happened quite a few years ago. Uh, for example, 9-11, and that's, of course, uh, 20 years ago uh, this year. But still, there are many lessons uh, learned from that. Uh, and I've written extensively about uh, uh, all the discussions that took place about the museum and the monument and also the uh, how to deal with all the dead people and how to work on identifying as many people as possible from uh, the more than 2,600 who were missing after the World Trade Center collapsed. So I talked to a lot of people and uh, the, the, this list here, uh, that, uh, that's just a few of the different types of people that I have been, uh, been talking to when I have been uh, researching this book. So it's been, uh, to, to end this uh, introduction, I, I think it has been a very, very interesting um, few years for me. It has taken many more years than I thought it would, but uh, that was the case with the first book too, so I, I guess that's just uh, the way it is. Uh, but uh, I also found out that uh, I had to just at one time say this is the deadline, because new uh, events were taking place all the time, and I, I constantly came up with new uh, parts that I thought should be in the book. But eventually on the 1st of September last year, I had to say, this is it. Uh, I, I can't uh, write anymore now because then it will never be finished. And then of course it was about a, a half a year's uh, production time with Routledge and with uh, correcting the grammar and all that and deciding where the pictures would be. But then, uh, as I mentioned, it, it finally came out yesterday. So I'm very happy to finally be able to see it in print uh, one day soon. And then asked me if I had any uh, main uh, lessons learned. And we can discuss that, of course, uh, uh, in the next few, few minutes coming up. But I have written down three here. 
And one of the main lessons learned for me, and I want to hear your perspectives of, on this, of course, uh, is that uh, it's important to realize that all disasters have uh, a personal impact on a lot of people, not just the people we read about in the newspaper the first day or so, but we need to really look at the wider aspect of all the people who have been involved either as part of their job or just by being part, uh, being at the wrong place at the wrong time, or because they have been personally affected. And as I mentioned, it, uh, it takes a long time. So that's my second uh, lesson learned after talking to all these people in many different parts of the world is that healing takes time and no one can expect anyone to get over it. We should just uh, stop talking about that because uh, your lives will be changed uh, when something dramatic uh, happens. And my last uh, point of learning for me is that I have seen so many heroes, so many people doing a fantastic job uh, all around the world, either as part of their job. I interviewed, for example, a communications expert in Las Vegas who was talking about all the work they did uh, right after the mass shooting uh, there. I talked to a, a survivor in Las Vegas, Michael Engen, uh, who might be joining us here. He also uh, was a hero in Las Vegas, saving many, many lives and risking his own life, uh, trying to, to make uh, other people uh, survive after what had happened. And there are also other kinds of heroes uh, that we don't really ever hear about. Uh, for example, all the doctors and nurses who are working really, really hard now everywhere in the world to try to combat uh, the COVID-19. So in, in conclusion, I have found that uh, we really need to focus more on people, in my opinion, when we are working not just on crisis communication, but also on crisis management. Thank you. Thank you, Kaijal. Uh, I'm going to suggest you write a book on writing a book. <laughs> write, write a book about writing a book when you've got a full-time job and a family and all of that stuff because uh, that's actually been on my list for several years and I've just not uh, I've not had I've not done it I shouldn't say I've not had the chance I haven't made the commitment to to doing that so uh, what really stood out for me was your commitment when you were talking about how far you traveled um, to meet with people that's damn commitment sir mm. damn commitment um, which is super impressive. I haven't been, well, I, I, I did start a book. I think I have a word document that has a paragraph on it somewhere. That's a start. Um, <laughs> that's a start. Yeah. So, yeah. so good on you. So I think what I'll do, I don't want to, it's, this isn't the, the Ben show, it's the Kaijo show. So what I'll do is just say, Hey, if anybody has a question or a comment that you want to toss to Kaijo, um, so we're not stepping over each other, maybe just, Maybe just drop in the chat box, you know, hey, me, I'd like a question. And then we'll just call on you so we're not stepping over each other's, each other's mic. Okay, Ann, you're up. Just like that. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. And um, Shell, congratulations on your book coming out. Nice to see the hard copy, I'm sure. Um, a question for you, Shell, and then I guess others may have a view here. I'm mindful that um, all, all the people on this call are interested in crisis communications, perhaps from a professional perspective, whatever you do in emergency management. And uh, my question, it's kind of a comment, but a question follows from it. Um, I know I talked with you, Shell, about the Sewell Ferry disaster in South Korea because I was made aware of it. I knew nothing about it before I was put in, in touch with Families Association. And it's an example like the disaster I was involved in, the Hillsborough Football Stadium tragedy in 1989, where part of the tragedy of these disasters was the government cover up over many years, the failure to get truth, accountability and justice, something they're still fighting for in Hillsborough. And my question really for you is what might be the role of emergency management professionals, crisis communication professionals in the longer term when there are these outstanding issues? Bearing in mind that the backdrop is we've moved historically over decades from a situation where crisis management was sometimes called press and PR training, where the blue light services and others were trained about how never to say sorry, to cover their reputation and all of that, 
through to now where we have citizen journalism, much more democratisation, fake news and all of that. Where does the crisis communications professional sit in that practically in terms of communication and perhaps the moral responsibility? There's a challenge to keep these issues alive over the longer term. Thank you. <clears throat> wow, I think that's a, a very good question. And I hope some of the other participants here can also join in. Uh, my view is that we really need to work more together internationally and uh, share each other's stories. And as I mentioned, I've been to, to several uh, um, international uh, seminars where I've learned a lot. And I think it would be important for those seminars to also focus on these uh, disasters that we haven't heard much about, even if the government there doesn't want it. Another example that uh, comes from Europe, that uh, at least in Norway we didn't hear much about, uh, was a, a, a roof collapse in a, a shopping center in Riga in Latvia in 2013, where 54 people died. And at least in Norway, it, uh, it wasn't news at all. And I know some people there and, and they uh, told me that, uh, uh, of course, in Latvia, the government uh, has a, a more uh, uh, stricter role and they were able to, to quell shit as much uh, as they could. And it, uh, it didn't become news. But I really believe that we as professional communicators need to also bring up uh, those questions and uh, get the, the awareness out. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to Dan and then to Shauna. Great. Well, Kaijul, first of all, thank you for um, asking me to review the book. I highly recommend it to those of you um, really interested in the topic. It, it's very well written and it's, it's, it's really a useful resource. Um, I wanted to comment on something that you mentioned regarding the CEO as a communicator during a crisis. Now, I've been doing research in the area and I also wanna share with you an interview that I conducted with the head of corporate communications at BASF a couple of years ago they had an explosion in their chemical plant. And um, in the crisis management plan, it actually addressed the issue of who would be the communicator during this type of crisis. And um, the head of the manufacturing facility was designated to be the spokesperson. And they followed that. And uh, the company was criticized uh, for that and that the, the CEO wasn't communicating. And that changed afterwards during the crisis. Um, but what I want to kind of highlight here is that um, you can do uh, planning in advance and really from a logical standpoint, um, I mean, there was logic to uh, choosing the head of the manufacturing facility because the head of the manufacturing facility has really um, in-depth knowledge and know-how with regards to aspects of the operations. But where they got it wrong was the reaction of stakeholders to the specific crisis. So, um, you know, when assessing who needs to be the spokesperson and when uh, the CEO should speak, um, really have to take into consideration situational factors that sometimes aren't stipulated in the crisis management plan. Great, yeah. I, I totally agree with you and, and that's, uh... Uh, I've written many, many pages about the, the role of the CEO, and uh, it has to be decided or planned for in advance as much as possible, but you also have to, of course, be flexible and uh, see what person is right for each uh, job. And we have also found, of course, a little bit, not just so much about crisis communication, but uh, victim support, how really important it is for the CEO to travel to uh, the place where something happened as soon as possible, not wait uh, five days like uh, the CEO of the train uh, company in Lac Megantic did, but you have to go there as soon as possible just to meet with the people who have been affected. Yes. Shauna, and uh, I'm just gonna try to uh, make my colleague Jeff Angel the host for this meeting as I need to jump on another one so if you have any uh questions direct them to to jeff if you will jeff i'm just throwing that on you okay so i'm gonna make you the host uh and kaijal thank you so much friend i'll still be here but i'm i have to pay attention over here for a few minutes shauna and then steven 
Thanks, Ben. Um, and, and Kaijal, it's great meeting you in, after our exchanges and that. And I appreciate all the work you're doing to contribute to this field of practice with the writing, because I so admire that. And it's interesting because you made a comment about um, when you were giving your, your chat about, you know, not really knowing how the crisis it impacts so many people, right? And, and sometimes we may not consider that it's not just the survivors or those, those that we've lost and their families, but I always remember this powerful interview I heard from a mayor of X Shaw, which was during the Southern Alberta floods that, that you referenced there with Ben. And he was where the landslide happened, right? Where the highway one, our big Trans Canada was blocked off for, for traffic. And I always remember this interview he gave where he said, you know, I was out mowing my lawn one day because where the landslide came, I wasn't impacted. He said, yet my neighbor at the same time was hauling out all of his possessions that were completely demolished with his house being flooded out with this mudslide and landslide. And he says, and the guilt that I felt that here I am, the mayor of this community, and I'm trying to speak to the people about rebuilding. And I felt like everyone in the community was looking at me going, well, what's your problem? You know, hmm. you don't have anything. You have no skin in this game. He said, it was hard from a leadership perspective to feel like he was gaining the trust to move the community forward. So, so that was my first thing I wanted, I wanted to say. So thank you for, for admitting that that's, you know, the, the crisis goes beyond those immediately impacted. Um, and the second thing I wanted to, to say was about your thoughts on survivors and monuments. And I'm just going to see if I can click this into here. But I dealt with a lot of the families of our fallen from uh, Afghanistan when I was in the army. And um, healing takes time. And what was really an interesting observation that we had to manage as public affairs officers as we were coming around this was, one family over time or a spouse that was uh, that had lost their husband may a, a widow may want to move on right they may want to move on with their with their new life they found a new partner they've, they've they've got a new family situation happening but the parents of that fallen soldier isn't there yet and so they have this conflict within the family uh, itself. And we found that there was just different levels at which people were healing. And this was the thing I posted in there is when the military in Canada tried to put the Afghanistan Memorial into Ottawa and do a really quiet ceremony without involving any of the families of the fallen and the pushback they got. So it just sort of completely highlights what we were saying is you know, everyone heals at a different time. Everyone's in a different space. And you have to include families and recognize as communicators that you are going to have something down the road to communicate on all those anniversaries and with those, memori those mm. memorials and monuments. And they mean the world to those people. So I'm just was sharing that to say, bang on, absolutely, we're seeing that even with stuff that we're dealing with up here. So thank you. Thank you very much, John, and really nice to see you finally. Yes. And I certainly agree uh, regarding monuments. And I could talk for an hour about that because... In Norway, as you might have heard, we have had some really, really uh, big problems with uh, building a monument uh, to commemorate the 69 people who died on the Utøya Islands. And it has been a, a big controversy. And uh, some people have taken the Norwegian government to court to try to stop the monument from being built. And it looks like it will finally be built and be ready by the 10 year anniversary, which is coming up this July. But uh, in the meantime, it has gone from uh, uh, one type of monument, which, which was supposed to cost maybe like five million uh, Canadian dollars. And now it's uh, become a much bigger thing. That, and the price is now 50 million Canadian dollars. And so people are saying, what's happening here? And why are we paying so much money to commemorate these 69 people? What about all the other people who die? What about the, uh, the person who lost his son in a car accident? Nothing happens to, uh, to, to, to commemorate that on a government level. So it's, it's a lot of controversy regarding that, yes. Um, I, know, I know Stephen's got a question, uh, and I'll get to you right after my comment here. I just wanted to build on that because um, I am uh, fascinated, well, fascinated and interested in the, in the monument conversation. In Calgary, much much smaller news, but five uh, students, university students, were killed at a house party um, by the son of a police officer. 
actually who was struggling with some mental health issues. I think had gone off his medication, but they were killed in a, a house party in a community in Northwest Calgary. And I know from involvement with the city councilor there, the families really wanted to build the monument on the house. Mm. The rest of the people that owned property on that street said, no way, right? They didn't want the cars driving. It was a real hot potato is, is the word. And in, in the end, it, the house ended up getting sold. Uh, I'm not sure I would have bought it, but somebody did probably very deeply discounted. But there was a real um, uh, uh, almost never ending debate on what the right thing to do was. And depending upon your perspective, I mean, I can certainly relate to almost everyone that had a perspective on that if I was in their shoes. So I'd, I'd maybe uh, throw that back out to you, Kaijal. Yeah, what you, you, you know, your, 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 your experience and your research would probably maybe you can help me. Uh, decipher what what uh how the best path forward might be i think a lesson learned in norway was at least that you really have to think about all the people involved and what happened here in norway was that uh, we forgot to talk to the neighbors the people who would be seeing this monument every day and they were also the same people who had risked their lives to go into small boats to try to save the people on the island and now they felt that the government just uh, neglected them. And so they took uh, the government to court and it took uh, a long, long time. So you really need to also think about the people who are right next door and uh, who you might otherwise uh, forget about. All right. Great point. Okay, we're gonna go down in New Zealand. Stephen, I know you had a, a question. I think your internet's okay. Do you wanna, uh, do you wanna ask it? You want me to, to read it? So yeah, I'll give it a try. Uh, I don't have the best signal. I'm up in uh, outside of New York City, so oh, sorry. Wish, wish I was sitting in New Zealand right now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, Sean, my question was in the kind of new media environment here in the states. This has been awful with the rise of fake media and disinformation, uh, and really again. Uh, Misinformation that comes from some very traditional and established news sources, as well, of course, through all the different social media channels. Uh, I was thinking in terms of COVID, there's so much distrust we know uh, in the literature and the science here when we have public health emergencies directed towards public officials. How in this new era of fake news, deep fakes, uh, things of this nature, how does the crisis communications professional accommodate and adjust for the flow of disinformation pushing back against hopefully the flow of, you know, constructive and, and professional information that you're sharing. How do you kind of navigate this new landscape? Wow, that's a great question. And that could be its own book, I think, because it's so interesting and, and so many aspects to it. And I don't have a, a good answer to that. I can just say that we are very lucky in Norway and in Scandinavia that we have a very high trust level of the Norwegian government and the same in Sweden and Denmark. And there are some, some new research reports out that say that, uh, you know, maybe 90% 90, 90 of Norwegians trust uh, the prime minister or someone else who's talking about the, the crisis. We still have had a few demonstrations uh, just uh, last week. We had people outside the Norwegian parliament demonstrating against uh, the the restrictions that we have and saying that uh, there is no crisis and it's just like the, the normal flu. But the, I think the, the trust level is very, very important. And that has, of course, been built up over many, many years. And one thing we did uh, that I was part of uh, to, to fight the fake news regarding COVID-19 was to have the prime minister and our other ministers on uh, FaceTime and uh, question and answer time uh, directly on Facebook. And uh, they were then answering lots of questions from the public and also admitting that sometimes they didn't have an answer, but they would uh, look into it. And so there are some ways you can do it, but uh, it's a very big uh, challenge, I think. And we really need to cooperate between the borders or across the borders to find uh, the solutions, I think. Great. Okay, we're going to go back to uh, the Hoosier State. Jen, you got a question? 
I do. Actually, two questions. Okay. All right. So the first one is in talking with everybody, and I know you talk to a lot of people, what was the overarching theme? Maybe it's in the book, maybe it's not in the book, but what did you pick up on more from a human spirit, humanitarian, like what stuck out to you? That's a great, great question too. And uh, like I mentioned, uh, one of the main points was that uh, uh, this talk about the time frame that uh, it will not be over in a year or so, that it really takes time. And also that there are so many aspects that uh, you can't plan for. Uh, and one example is I, I met with a, a minister in Newtown where, you know, the Sandy Hook shooting was in, I think it was in 2012. And that was one of the most uh, emotional meetings I had when uh, researching this book, uh, because he had been in charge of uh, six funerals in five days uh, afterwards. And you know, these were first graders who had been killed. So it had uh, been a, a very tough uh, emotional um, toll on him uh, just by doing that. But he was also telling him about me about all the things they had not planned for. And this is a, a kind of a small community, you know, and uh, what uh, shocked them and what uh, was a big uh, challenge was all the donations that uh, they started uh, receiving. And people from all over the states, and I'm sure many of you know more about this than I, were sending them uh, not just uh, uh, money, which I would have been helpful, but lots and lots of items, lots of toys. They received more than 65,000 teddy bears and there are 20,000 people living there. So it was just enormous and it became a real burden, also emotionally, to deal with all these, uh, these uh, gifts pouring in. And they had no plans, had not thought of that in advance at all. And I don't think you can blame them for that, but it just shows that there are so many aspects of crisis management that you need to try to prepare for and have the right uh, staff uh, to, to take care of. Oh, absolutely. I mean, don't donation management is is part of it. And it's hard because you don't know exactly what's going to come in. And then the, the second and final question, at least for now, is what is a gap? Like, what did you hear was missing in these conversations? What is it that individuals needed that wasn't there? Like you, you did point out a little bit, they didn't plan for donation management. But here in the United States, some of that is a known when you create an all hazard plan, right? Not everywhere, of course, here, but majority of the cities. But what is missing? Like, what did you hear in the conversations that we need to think about in developing the plans? That's another great question. And uh, there are many answers to that, of course. Uh, but one would be that uh, there needs to be some somebody or someone taking care of people after the first days, <clears throat> maybe after the first week or so, because I've written a lot about, uh, you know, what we have been calling the family assistance center, uh, which is now supposed to be called the incident assistance center, because it's not just for families, but that lasts for maybe a week or 10 days or so. And uh, when that closes down, and many of the people there have no place to go. And uh, in the States, there are a few of these resiliency centers. And I visited a couple of them in Newtown and in Las Vegas. They do a very, very good job, I think, with keeping up uh, a kind of service for those who need it. But we have seen, for example, in Norway, we had a, a family assistance center set up at a hotel near Utøya, and it was open for maybe five days. And people, uh, some of the parents who were there who had lost their kids uh, or a kid uh, on Utøya didn't want to leave because they knew that they were going home to an empty house and uh, they felt that they needed more help in that transition period. So I think that's a, a learning point, at least in Norway and uh, in many other countries, I would think. Great, thank you. Uh, I've got a question from Fred here. Who's, he's driving through the mountains. Um, it's a little spotty, so I'm going to ask it. Uh, Kajali, he's asking if you have some uh, common sense examples or where some real 
um, uh, spur of the moment thinking helped out. And he, he offers the example of the floods in Kelowna, British Columbia, a few years ago, where the high school uh, students were recruited to fill sandbags. Um, and I'm not an engineer, so I'm trying to get this visual. He said, use sandbags to put on sawhorses with pylons to, to fill them. Um, I think I've got that. But you ha did, did you come across that in any of your research uh, for your book and any of the stories that, uh, that you heard? Yeah, I could, could mention one example that, that I found very interesting, and that has to do with uh, the shooting in Las Vegas. And as I mentioned, I, I traveled there to, to meet with many of the people who had been affected. And one of them, uh, she is a singer uh, in Las Vegas. Ashton Zayer is her name. And she was following lots of different Facebook pages uh, after the mass shooting and seeing that uh, so many people were trying to find their hero, trying to find out who was helping them get over the bridge or get to the hospital or who was driving them uh, somewhere or who was admitting uh, first aid. And so she found out that she had some time on her hand and she decided to start a Facebook page that was just uh, made to find heroes. So she called it Find My LV Hero. And the more than 60 people after her manual work on this Facebook page were able to reconnect and she said that uh, she got so many much good feedback afterwards because it was so important for the people who had been saved by someone to finally meet them, maybe uh, digitally, but also in, in, uh, in real life. So, and, and she just used that, you know, a free tool, Facebook, to, to do that and had some free time. What a great example. Uh, that's awesome. I, I have one, it, it might seem obvious, and I'm, I'm going to do my best to to, to phrase it, but I, I know that the, the shooting in Norway involved, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of children, a lot of young, young, uh, young adults, Newtown, obviously, a lot of um, elementary school students. Is there any way that you could quantify, I mean, unexpected uh, death and tragedy is obviously unimaginable for, for most of us, but in particular, when it involves children um, and, and people at the beginning of their life, is, is, there, is, is there a way that you can um, quantify, like, is that that much more difficult to, to deal with? Like, this is my question. Yeah, and that's a good point. And, and I found that, yes, that is a major, uh, major, uh, it's, it's very important who is, uh, are the victims. And of course, when there are, are very young people involved, uh, there will be much more attention and we've seen that, for example, after the Sandy Hook shooting and also on Utøya when there were all these uh, young people. And actually, it's a, it's a very inter interesting story that I've described a little bit uh, in this book. And that's uh, there were two uh, uh, siblings in Norway who were 18 and 20 years old on the 22nd of July in 2011. And the man who was 18, he was in Oslo and he was affected by the uh, the explosion there and his sister was 20 and she was on Utøya Island. So both, both of them were affected by the same terrorist. But they found that the uh, media attention and attention from friends was much more focused on her because she had been where all the young people were. Mm -hmm. And uh, lots of people really forgot about uh, uh, the man who had been very, very close to being killed in, in Oslo. So there was a big difference. Right. Okay, I'm going to go back to Anne. She's got a comment. Anne, you wanted to talk about the meeting the rescuers? Yeah, just a brief comment. Um, the, what, it's a fantastic opportunity and, and something that's very important for many people directly caught up in disasters to make sense of their experience more broadly, which is where meeting the person who rescued you can be really significant. But I think also what we've learned from experience is that, um, that that brings all sorts of cons as well, pros and cons, potentially, for example, for responders who then feel under pressure to meet, whether it's professionals or not. Um, secondly, for those for whom they couldn't rescue or help, and that's difficult. In other words, that um, professionally, what we probably want to say is we, you'd want to manage that process in terms of preparing, briefing, debriefing, all of those involved. It, it doesn't always have a nice outcome. Mm. We're seeing that, for example, in the Manchester Arena attack. We've got the public inquiry currently going on. Many young people involved, 22 people killed in a terrorist attack uh, just in the fourth year now. 
And in the next month, it's going to go through all the personal circumstances of how people died, survivability, etc. Unwittingly, it means that stories for those who were in a coma after are going to find out for the first time stuff. So, you know, the authorities and others, not least the legal teams, are mindful of doing that in a very safe, facilitated environment. So, again, it's an example of the pros and cons of how everything's become much more democratised now and how people can do it for themselves with Facebook. It doesn't even cost anything. But, um, but you know, it, it kind of brings real challenges as well. And I would say, again, from personal experience, the longer it takes to build that story, there's now opportunities. I was involved in a disaster where many people died 32 years ago. I now have the chance to reach out and find, because the videos become available, of people who pulled me out of this crush. But actually, it's hard. I never would have thought I would be saying it's harder 30 years later than it would have been even at the beginning. So just a warning that while it makes a lovely human interest story, it has to be really carefully thought about in terms of the pros and cons for all. Mm -hmm. Great comment. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to build on that. I'm, I'm mindful of time. I know we're coming to the end, but I remember at the beginning of, beginning of my career, I was the director of corporate communications for Canadian Airlines. It was subsequently bought by Air Canada, and the uh, airport of Edmonton, which does a great job of being prepared and running mock disasters. So they, we had one that day, and then I was to brief the media, and then they asked me to go brief the families. So, this was a scenario, they were all acting. I, I, to this day, I can remember the gut punch I felt when they started coming at me as, as acting as if the grief. And I was like, wow, I took away such, it was really humbled by the, the, the skill set and the preparation and the empathy. I, I can't imagine. So I've never had to, to, to brief family members in a disaster, but it, to me, all we're talking about comes back to that that preparation and that training. The last thing I would want to do is throw somebody into brief the families if they hadn't been really well trained on how to do that. Sort of building on your point, Dan. Good. Okay. Do we have any any other comments or last questions for Kaijul? We're good. Thumbs up. <laughs> There's Darren's uh, contact info. Feel real free to share your contact info. Kaijal, thank you so, so much. Really appreciate not only you coming here today, the time and commitment and research you've done now on both your both your books. Uh, look forward to uh, to reading them. And uh, I know you you always make an effort to to join our events. And I want to say we really appreciate it. Love your perspective. Love what you bring to our, uh, our community. So thank you so much for that. Thank uh, you so much for having me. It was really great and really great to see all of you people that uh, I have met before digitally and uh, in person. So really nice. Thank you. Yeah. And thanks again for all of you for joining. It was great. Crisis and coffee. So we do this the last Thursday of every month if you've got a topic or uh, or an idea you'd like us to touch on or or uh, want to share something yourself just let us know um and i want to you know really thank all of you for your commitment to crisis communications and for your respect to honing our skills and making all of us better when we come together like this so thank you so Great. much everyone and uh, we'll see you if we don't see you before next month we'll we'll uh, talk to you before then yeah, great. Okay, Thanks, have a nice evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>